Perfect, David, ready when you are. Good afternoon, everybody. This is David Marsh. I'm the chairman of OMPFIF, and it's a great pleasure to introduce today Jens Weidmann, who's the president of the Deutsche Bundesbank. He's been in post since May 2011, and he's still going strong, and I think he may well be on cue to become the longest ever serving <laughs> member of the Deutsche Bundesbank once you take over the 12 years that I think your illustrious predecessor, Carl Blessing, sent back in the 1950s and the 1960s. You're also the chairman of the Bank for International Settlements in Basel. So welcome, Jens. Uh, really looking forward to what you have to say. All of this is totally on the record and there'll be questions afterwards. Jens, the floor is yours. Thank you, David. And in particular, thank you for your kind words of introduction, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for having me. It's a great pleasure to join you today. I would have been only too happy to come to London, but uh, the pandemic thwarted our plans. But luckily events such as this one can be shifted to the virtual sphere. In spring, many, um, let me just, in spring, many things that enrich our daily lives were no longer able to take place. Concert halls, museums, Restaurants, cafes, and gyms had to close. Cinemas also have been hit hard. One film release after the other has been postponed, and even one of London's most famous residents, James Bond, had to give way. Then over the summer, large parts of the economy rebounded, and a new blockbuster found its way into the multiplexes. Christopher Nolan's world-spanning thriller, Tenet. The film's plot centers around the idea that the flow of time can be inverted, which allows objects and people to move backwards through time. Actions running forwards and those going backwards collide in the here and now. As you might imagine, that brings a great deal of confusion into the protagonist's plans. However, from an economist's point of view, there's already enough potential for trouble, even with time flowing in only one direction. In both monetary and fiscal policy, there, is an, there are incentives for policymakers to announce a certain course of action today and deviate from it tomorrow. For example, the government could announce to seek price stability, but then trade it off for lower unemployment in the short run by creating surprise inflation. Of course, people might be fooled once or twice, but not all the time. Rational agents anticipate policymakers' behavior and they adjust prices and wages accordingly, causing higher inflation without any reduction in employment. The result is an inflation bias. To get rid of it, authorities must be able to credibly commit to price stability. In practice, this has been achieved by delegating this objective to central banks and granting them independence. The debate seems to lie far back in time, but problems of time and consistency are at the very heart of monetary policy, and our strategy has to take due account of it. The subject is currently on the table in the euro system as part of our strategy review. And I shall go into some key issues of the review later in my speech. Even with independent central banks, monetary and fiscal policy still interact. The economist Eric Lieber once summed it up as follows, and I quote, both policies are intricately intertwined and their distinct impacts are difficult to disentangle. Recalcitrant behavior by one policy authority can easily thwart the other authorities' efforts to achieve its objectives. The thorny relationship between monetary and fiscal policy is something we have known about for a long time. To extend the film metaphor, it is in some respects a relationship similar to that of a couple in a screwball comedy. They cannot ignore each other, but if they get too close, things can become turbulent. In my speech, I would like to discuss some aspects of this special relationship, in particular, the problem of fiscal dominance. This subject has been gaining attention again recently, and that is related to the measures adopted by monetary and fiscal policymakers to cope with the COVID-19 crisis that has unfolded since March. It is important that monetary policy remains expansionary as the economic slump is weighing on the inflation outlook and the lack of liquidity in the financial system might dangerously aggravate the crisis. Adverse feedback loops between the economy and the financial system could also pose a risk to price stability. And that is why the Eurosystem responded quickly in spring with a whole bunch of measures. 
this contribution to stabilization in the crisis was and is important. However, fiscal policy has taken the lead, and quite rightly so. It has both the democratic legitimacy for heavy interventions and the custom fit instruments. Lockdowns and voluntary social distancing led to massive revenue shortfalls in some industries. These shortfalls can disrupt the overall flow of payments in the economy and severely constrain the spending of many households and firms. Fiscal policy, unlike monetary policy, can address this problem in a targeted manner by substituting lost income with transfers. Now, the pandemic has forcefully researched and stricter containment measures are back in force in many places, including Germany. Clearly, this will place a strain on the economy in the current quarter. The first wave of the, of the pandemic has showed in some countries that even in the absence of tight government restrictions, the economy suffers as people become more cautious on their own account. This time, the economic fallout is likely to be less severe than in spring, since the containment measures are more targeted and firms have gained experience to deal with them. We've also learned that when the protective measures were relaxed and people regained their confidence, the economy quickly revived. The rebound in summer was in fact significantly stronger than expected. On the other hand, it may take a while until COVID-19 is contained in a sustained manner. From today's point of view, a succession of lockdowns and subsequent resurgences cannot be ruled out. To protect the economy beyond the very short term, it is imperative that the pandemic be kept in check and eventually overcome. Moreover, fiscal policymakers need to ensure that a quick and strong recovery is possible by stabilizing the economy now, supporting a rebound and counteracting second ground effects. In particular, a broad wave of corporate insolvencies would cost jobs and destroy production capacity for good. It could also spill over to the banking sector by way of rising credit defaults. Through lending constraints, it could have repercussions for the real economy. In spring, rapid and comprehensive fiscal and economic policy action staved off an even deeper slump, which would have caused serious long-term harm to the economy. With its sound public finances, Germany was in a comparatively good starting position, but other European countries have less fiscal leeway. Unfortunately, some of them were hit hard by the pandemic. They were not left on their own. European governments have acted in solidarity and agreed on various measures to help crisis-stricken member states. One major component of this is the EU Recovery Fund. This assistance should go hand in hand with reforms that strengthen the resilience and competitiveness of the recipients' economies. Such reforms are rarely popular, but they would too be an act of solidarity because they would contribute to the joint effort of enhancing resilience and relieve the community in the next crisis. This also includes all member states turning to fiscal soundness after the crisis. The EU fiscal rules are actually intended to ensure that this happens. Up to now, however, they've lacked teeth. It will therefore be important that the necessary reforms establish a clearer and also a more binding framework. Improved fiscal rules will be more important than ever. Deficits and debt are rising sharply this year in all member states. The European Commission estimates that the euro area's debt to GDP ratio will jump by almost 17 percentage points and exceed the 100% mark by the end of this year. While deficits are likely to recede considerably next year, the crisis will leave behind perceptibly higher debt ratios. Policymakers must also not lose sight of the longer term challenges such as the burdens presented by an aging society or climate change. At the moment, the burden of debt is not all too heavy since states financing conditions are very favorable. Last year, government's implicit interest rate, that is interest, interest expenditure as a percentage of debt dropped, dropped to just 1.9% in the euro area, down from 3.9% in 2009. Monetary policy has played a part in keeping interest rates low. Large scale bond purchases have been part of the very expansionary stance. Clearly, government bond purchases can be a legitimate and effective monetary policy tool, but they risk blurring the line between fiscal and monetary policy. 
The problems are particularly pronounced in a monetary union with fiscally autonomous member states. Here, such purchases involve the fundamental risk of neutralizing sovereign liability risk through the central bank's balance sheets. Decisions on the redistribution of liability risk should be taken, if at all, by parliaments and governments, not by central banks. The PSPP, the asset purchase program that the Eurosystem set up in 2015, features important guarantees and safeguards to curb this risk. Nevertheless, the Eurosystem central banks have become the member states' biggest creditors. And that was the case even before the current crisis. For the part of sovereign debt that is on our books, funding costs are decoupled from the capital market. The interest on these bonds flows to the central bank, which distributes them back to their treasuries as part of their profit. That weakens the disciplining role of markets. Thus, the incentives for sound budgeting diminish, especially as the US fiscal rules are weak. And this harbors risk for monetary policy. What might pose particular problems is the combination of unsound public finances and a persistently highly accommodative monetary policy. This could be habit forming. Cheap money may be increasingly seen as the normal state. Under those conditions, even high debt burdens may appear sustainable to governments, but what if conditions change? Monetary policy has the power to accommodate high levels of public debt. However, this ability is more of a curse than a blessing. Because if active use is made of it, price stability might take a backseat. The massive increase in government debt in the wake of the crisis could make this problem even more acute. Political pressures could arise and grow to keep interest rates lower than the rationale of price stability would call for. There would be nothing other than fiscal dominance as described by Michael Woodford. And I quote him, in fact, fiscally dominant regimes often do not involve any direct assignment of a signature target to the central bank as in the textbook analysis. Instead, fiscal dominance manifests itself through pressure on the central bank to use monetary policy to maintain the market value of government debt. If monetary policy gives in, fiscal policy might suddenly be left calling the shots. In the end, if monetary policy has to ensure the solvency of the government, the level of inflation would ultimately be determined by the requirements of fiscal policy. The impact on inflation might not be felt immediately, as some economists have pointed out, and uh, they pointed in particular to the role of expectations and learning when people do not have perfect knowledge. If policymakers deviate from the virtuous regime of monetary dominance, private agents may nevertheless expect that they will return to it soon enough to preserve price stability. But over time, if agents become more and more convinced that the deviation is not short-lived, inflation may accelerate. The drift in beliefs might hardly be detectable initially, but can gain momentum later and might appear to an external observer to have come out of the blue. To safeguard price stability in the long term, monetary policy relies on a sound fiscal policy. This is the story told not only by economic theory, but also by historical experience. Just think about the United States in the 1940s and early 1950s. Back then, the Federal Reserve and the Treasury had agreed to maintain relatively stable government bond yields. The arrangement was eventually terminated, but only when it came to be seen as an engine of inflation. Against this backdrop, Mervyn King's famous words might come to mind. Central banks are often accused of being obsessed with inflation. This is untrue. If they are obsessed with anything, it is with fiscal policy. A monetary policy geared to price stability needs a firm foundation that has to be laid by others. One cornerstone of that foundation are sound public finances. The further building block is monetary policy independence. We need that independence in order to, to pursue the objective of price stability, even when conflicts with other policy goals arise. In the current environment, monetary and fiscal policy are working in harmony without any coordination. Their respective goals are aligned, but we should not pretend that such harmony will be a permanent condition. David, you got to the heart of the matter when you said recently, central banks must not lose the ability to do the opposite when necessary, for example, when inflation rises. 
And you hinted that after the crisis, inflation would probably return. Ega Barge mentions several reasons why inflation pressure could rise in the medium term, ranging from stricter health requirements to deglobalization, rising market concentration, and demographic shifts. Indeed, Charles Goodhart and his co-author highlight in their latest book that demographic changes could soon reduce the global labor supply, and as a result, wages, inflation, and interest rates could start to accelerate again. It would be negligent to rule out the possibility that we might have to deal with inflationary forces again in the future. Charles came up with a metaphor for this, and I quote him, ignoring the potential inflationary dangers is the equivalent to an ostrich putting his head in the sand. And he goes on, but our typical central bank ostrich will say that even should there be some resurgence in inflation, we know how to deal with it. That position strikes me as an ahistorical one, end of quote. Central bankers, no, ma no matter whether they are considered to be hawks or doves, should not emulate the ostrich. We need to make it very clear that we are not going to place monetary policy at the service of fiscal policy. If we create a different impression, we are putting both our independence and our credibility at risk. And one more thing is important, keeping our distance, not just literally in times of the pandemic. One of the secrets of success for an independent monetary policy has always been recognizing and respecting one's own limitations. That includes a narrow interpretation of our mandate and keeping the required distance from fiscal policy. Ladies and gentlemen, given large central bank holdings of sovereign bonds and elevated government debt, the monetary fiscal interaction has become a strategic issue. It is therefore also a subject for the Eurosystem's monetary policy strategy review. This process is broad-based. Without prejudging the outcome, what is fixed is our mandate. Our primary objective is to maintain price stability in the euro area. The question is how we are best able to fulfill this mandate in future. We are in the middle of the debate at present. It is too early to draw any conclusions. But let me share some thoughts on three issues we are looking at. First, the clarification of the monetary policy aim. Second, the implications of a makeup strategy. And third, the measurement of inflation. Questions of definition often tend to be perceived as a boring formality. That is not the case in monetary policy. Here, the definition of the aim is of central importance because it forms the heart of the strategy. This is where inflation expectations should be anchored not only for the financial markets, but also for enterprises and households. Thus far, we have defined price stability as annual inflation rates between zero and 2%. And within this range, the ECB governing council aims to keep inflation rates in the euro area below but close to 2% over the medium term. Even many experts are not familiar with this distinction between the definition of price stability and our policy aim. This suggests that our strategy should be made easier to understand on this point. The desired inflation rate is also something we will discuss in the governing council. We should take due account of the fact that there are several design features which could influence the level of actual inflation. For example, strengthening the symmetry of our aim could raise the average expected inflation rate. So far, the policy aim has been close to the upper edge of the range of price stability fairly small upward deviations would violate the definition of price stability as opposed to comparable downward deviations. Seen in that light, inflation of 2% might be perceived as a ceiling and the monetary policy reaction function would be deemed asymmetric. In my view, an explicitly symmetric formulation of our target would be clearer and also easier to understand than our current version. However, we have to look at formulating our monetary policy aim as an interrelated whole of desired inflation rate, symmetry, and policy horizon. We must not set individual aspects in isolation. This also includes the question of whether it should be a target point or a target range. A clear-cut target point could help to firmly anchor inflation expectations. On the other hand, it could in principle constrain monetary policy flexibility. And I think, Flexibility is important. Let's be realistic. Monetary policy cannot control inflation right down to the decimal point, let alone in a certain month or quarter. 
But flexibility could also be achieved through design features other than a target band. In particular, the existing medium term orientation provides a high degree of flexibility. It also takes account of the fact that monetary policy decisions achieve their full effect only with a time lag that can vary. Monetary policymakers should be able to wait if there are good reasons to do so and not to react hastily to every change in the data. Overall, I believe we should word our monetary policy aim so that it is understandable, realistic, and forward-looking. Regarding time orientation to date, our side remains fixed on the desired inflation rate over the medium term. This helps to anchor inflation expectations, which are key for a forward-looking monetary policy. There are also situations in which it would help monetary policy if inflation expectations were higher in the short term. For example, when inflation is low and our interest rates are already close to or at their effective lower bound. Indeed, such situations might arise more frequently than in the past. Many studies point to structural forces having pushed real interest rates downwards in recent decades and estimates of the natural rate of interest along with them. Here, the concept of makeup strategies comes into play. Specifically, under average inflation targeting, Monetary policy responds to deviations of the average inflation rate from its target with the average calculated over a certain window that extends into the past. That means if the rate of inflation has been running below the target, this deviation has to be offset later by rates above the target. Inflation expectations would accordingly rise over the short term and, ceteris paribus, the real interest rate would fall. Thus, makeup strategies could provide some stabilization gains especially when policy rates are close to the effective lower bound. The average inflation targeting concept appears to offer a tailor-made solution for the current situation. But a monetary policy strategy should be designed for the longer term and fit a variety of economic situations. And in this regard, average inflation targeting raises some concerns and questions. If inflation had at some time been moving above the target for a number of years, the central bank would have to push inflation not only down to the target, but even notably lower into range that the central bank currently regards as dangerous. Thus, central banks could forego that and handle average inflation targeting asymmetrically. This shows that a past dependent monetary policy can encounter more pronounced time inconsistency problems. There might be situations in which there are strong incentives to depart from the strategy, and that would come with the price tag that price tag is the strategy's credibility. Added to that, the effectiveness of a makeup strategy hinges on the extent to which people understand it and form their expectations accordingly. That is asking a lot of market participants, but even more of households and firms. Studies suggest that central banks have had limited success in managing, managing households and firms' expectations to date. But these inflation expectations matter when it comes to pricing on the goods market. When households make decisions about their purchases, when companies set the prices of their products, or when employers and trade unions negotiate wages. As you can see, there are various open points that we have to discuss in depth in our review. For me, it is important that we have a strategy which doesn't just produce good results in economic models, but also works in practice. The measurement of inflation is also up for discussion in strategy review. As Christine Lagarde put it recently, this is not about moving the goalposts for monetary policy. It is about future proving how we measure inflation. The key measure of price stability is the harmonized index of consumer prices for the euro area. Taking consumer prices as a yardstick makes sense because price stability also means safeguarding the purchasing power of money. People expect that of us, and rightly so. Many people live in their own flats or houses. It is undisputed that the HSCP should really include this component. Yet, unoccupied housing is absent from the HSCP basket of goods for technical and also methodological reasons. Personally, I would be willing to accept some methodolog methodological shortcomings in order to better reflect people's real life situation. Finally, we should not lose sight of those elements of our existing strategy, which have proven their worth such as the medium-term orientation of monetary policy. It can help to incorporate into our decision-making process those risks to price stability, which might materialize only with a certain time lag. 
The financial crisis was a painful reminder of why that is important. The massive dislocations in the financial system triggered a severe economic crisis, and that left lasting scars. It had persistent repercussions on inflation and was one of the reasons why monetary policy has been struggling so much over the past decade. Sure, safeguarding financial stability is first and foremost a task for macroprudential policy. But monetary policymakers cannot look away when their own actions contribute to the buildup of financial imbalances that pose a, that pose a long-term risk to price stability. Here too, the rule applies. Monetary policy has to take into account its unintended side effects and constantly weigh up benefits and costs. Learning from the past is crucial to preparing for the future. History did not begin with the recent years of very low inflation or the global financial crisis and its severe consequences. Entrenched high inflation was a feature that shaped the 1970s and early 1980s. Think also of the previously widespread idea of a stable trade-off between unemployment and inflation along the Phillips curve. This view made policymakers in the 1960s believe that expansionary policies could permanently reduce unemployment at little cost. We've learned a lot from all these experiences. We should not forget these lessons when we make our strategy fit for the future. As Mark Twain is often paraphrased, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. Ladies and gentlemen, did you notice we've just gone back in time together? But a glance at the clock shows me the time is marching forward. So I will now come to a close. The director of Tenet, Christopher Nolan, is regarded as a master in the handling of time in his films. His breakthrough came with Memento, in which the protagonist suffers from a particular form of amnesia. He can remember things only for a few minutes before he forgets them again. And I sincerely hope that you don't feel the same after listening to my speech. John Kenneth Gabraith bemoaned the extreme brevity of the financial memory. He noted that there can be few fields of human endeavor in which history counts for so little as in the world of finance. Psychologists have found out that taking a few steps back can boost your memory. In a study, the test persons had better recall of pictures, films, and word lists if they had walked backwards a few steps. A positive effect was shown even when they only imagined walking backwards. So from time to time, it is useful to pause for a moment and take a few steps backwards. That could help us to remember the economic lessons of the past. Otherwise, there's a danger that we will have to relearn them as a painful insight gained from the next crisis. And we should spare ourselves that experience. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to the discussion now. Thank you very much, uh, Jens. That was a very thoughtful with uh, quite a few excerpts into history, psychology, and, and filmmaking. Let, let me start off with a, a, a cinematic uh, reference because you, uh, you reminded me actually, and your, your journey that you've made over the last few years regarding government bonds, uh, it reminded me a little bit of Stanley Kubrick's uh, 1964, how I learned to stop worrying and love the bond. <laughs> it reminded me a little bit of that. You did say that um, this is now a legitimate tool of monetary policy, buying government bonds. You also put forward a very, very severe denunciation of the dangers of fiscal dominance, which could at some stage hit us. Could you give us a bit of an element regarding timing? Wh when will we know that we are getting into a really dangerous period for fiscal dominance? You at the Bundesbank should be able to tell us more than anybody else. You'll be able to spot it when you see it, I guess. But uh, David, let me just come back to, to one of your remarks uh, related to my position on government bond purchases. I never claimed uh, that they were not a, a legitimate instrument of monetary policy if properly designed. My point was just that they also come with specific risks, in particular in monetary union, and therefore should be reserved for specific situations in which we need them and not be a normal tool of our monetary policy toolbox. Okay, no, I understand that. That, that, was, that was the position. And, and of course, you pose a very tricky uh, question that I'm not able to answer regarding fiscal dominance, um, because at the current juncture, the, as I said also in my speech, the interests of monetary policy and fiscal policy are rather aligned. 
uh, and you will be able to spot only, uh, let's say, that situation that I described in my speech, when those interests diverge, that is when um, price stability calls for a normalization of monetary policy, and that normalization then creates financial stability risk or uh, creates a risk for the uh, solvency of, of, of governments. Uh, and, and so then you will have a conflict. So it's okay, well, let me just ask one more question, then I'll go over to our panel of experts, because this is like a, a panel that is uh, interviewing football ma managers after a football match. But just one question for me, and then I'll hand over to the panel, starting with Charles Goodhart. But question for me, um, there is a danger, clearly, of central banks walking into a trap. You, you've mentioned this, they may no longer be able to put up interest rates because it could become rather unpopular uh, with governments who have amassed a great deal of debt. Would a decision by the governing council in December to extend the pandemic emergency purchase program beyond next summer, beyond June, would that necessarily cause us to worry more about the risk of fiscal dominance? Or do you think such an extension could be countenanced because of the pandemic and because we are still in an emergency situation? No, David, I think when we discuss monetary policy in December, and in December we'll also have the new round of uh, projections to base our decision on, then we, we decide uh, uh, what to do and what actions are necessary with the view of price stability in the medium term. Um, so our monetary policy actions are only a danger, as I said also in the speech, if they create the perception that this uh, state will go on forever and governments will get used to it and really don't, don't get their act together after the crisis to consolidate again uh, and if the fiscal rules are not uh, are not toughened uh, again after the the, the 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 pandemic, those are the issues I think we should we should look at. So it's it's up to the governments uh, to to find back uh, their way to a virtuous path for for public finances. It Okay, well, um, uh, nothing is forever, of course. Although that reminds me of diamonds are forever. So that's another James Bond link. Uh, would the panelists now please turn on their cameras. I'm going to ask Charles Goodhart from the London School of Economics. Uh, totally unrehearsed, uh, the uh, book was mentioned. If I ha happen to have a copy of the book on my desk, because it only <laughs> arrived uh, the other day, Charles, I've got your book. Charles, can you put your question, please? Quite fairly short question to Jens Weitmann. It would be a pleasure also, Charles, to see you. I can't see you at this point. Can you hear me now, Jens? Oh, I can hear and see you. You look great. Good to see you. Okay, great to see you, and thank you for the quote. Um, Jens, um, the current context is almost uniquely uncertain. We don't know when and how the COVID uh, pandemic will be over. We don't know how the recovery will take place. And as you said, there are lots of changing trends. Given the massive uncertainty we got at the moment, is not this actually just about the worst possible time to try and establish a new strategy? I mean, at a time when you, you, know, you don't know where you're going, you need maximum flexibility, apart from the fact that the Americans have done it probably wrongly. I mean, is, is it really sensible at this particular moment to try and ex to decide on, on a strategy? And if I could, a very quick second question. You talked about the need to have a sound fiscal policy. Fine, but I before uh, this meeting, I was actually listening to a digital discussion uh, on monetary and fiscal policies. And the general theme there was that as long as this temporary disaster of the pandemic goes on, it is absolutely essential to carry on with the expansionary fiscal policies. At what point do we actually stop and think about longer term sustainability and the soundness of fiscal policies, because the, the overwhelming consensus of mainstream e economists is now would be exactly the wrong time to do that. Thank you, Charles. Thank you. Uh, Jens, would you mind being perhaps more succinct, slightly more succinct <laughs> than, than Charles in his uh, uh, question, simply because we've got a lot of questions to get through. So thank you very much. I'll, I'll give it a crack. And, and Charles, I joined that consensus that you mentioned. Of course, now is not the time to start uh, fiscal consolidation. Now is the time for discretional fiscal stimulus. 
Uh, but I'm talking about the post-crisis time. And we've seen in the past, after the crisis, let's say the tendency to return to sound public finances has been not very pronounced. So it's not now that I'm concerned with. Now I think, uh, and, and it, it, rightly so, fiscal policy should take the lead. Fiscal policy should be expansionary and it should be better suited also to target the specific needs that the, the pandemic uh, uh, creates. Um, but after the crisis, of course, we have a different situation. That's, just, that's, that's what I was uh, talking about. And the experience so far has not been too reassuring, uh, even after, 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 the last, after the last crisis, if you look at the figures. But on your uh, first, first question, uh, which is, of course, uh, a, a very uh, important one, uh, Evidently, we planned the strategy review and started with the strategy review before the pandemic. And as you know, it has been a long time since the Eurosystem last time looked at its strategy. So it was about high time. And uh, I, I think the pandemic doesn't really call into question the strategy review in the sense that the strategy review is not a quick fix or an answer to the pandemic, but is rather supposed to react to structural changes that have occurred over a very long time and that will probably persist even after the, the pandemic has, has vanished. So it, it's a long-term issue and dealing with the crisis is a short-term issue. First and foremost, of course, it might leave some longer lasting scars uh, but this we, we then have to take into account into our strategy review. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll have Alistair Ryan now from... I don't see a contradiction in this. Of course, uncertainty is high, but that's more an issue for us in monetary policy making. I mean, it will be an issue for December and our current monetary policy debates. Sorry. David. We'll have Alistair now. Alistair Ryan from Bank of America. In the interest of brevity, maybe we'll stick to just one question per person. Charles was allowed to because he's just written a book, but just one <laughs> for you, Alistair. Uh, thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, uh, Mr. Weidman, so the ECB is absolutely committed to enabling banking union, so a fairly urgent priority, but Germany has, has not really participated. It's impeded the banking union through the ring fencing of German banks, even those owned for many years by other euro area partners, by the Dutch or the Italians. Um, can you commit to Germany playing its part in the acceleration of actually delivering the banking union? Yeah, first of all, I think I would uh, tend to disagree with you that Germany has been impeding the banking union. I think the point that we've been uh, making over and over again is that a banking union makes a lot of sense. And in particular, from a monetary policy perspective, of course, a more integrated monetary union is a very important uh, feature. But at the same time, we have to make sure that it works. And it can only work if you balance liability and control. So before making certain steps, you have to ensure that also you harmonize uh, policy making in other areas before you take on or assume liability or responsibility for those for those policy for those policy areas. And for instance, in the banking union, uh, um, the insolvency regimes are an important part of this. So, so our point here has been that we need to put a lot more policy areas on the table and further harmonization is needed if we want to go uh, uh, much deeper uh, when it comes to when it comes to, to integration. Um, and I'm, I'm a firm believer, uh, for instance, in the capital markets union, I think that could uh, be an important element also in stabilizing the monetary union, because there you have a risk sharing mechanism that you organize through the capital markets. Uh, that could complement the the one that is emerging on uh, in 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 let's say the, the public in the public in the public sector. Uh, but again, liability and 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 control is 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 has to be in balance has to be in balance. Yeah. Well, well, thank you for that answer. We can come back, I'm sure, in about a year's time and see where we are on banking union, see whether we've got any further forward. Could I ask uh, Agnes Belash from Bearings now, please, to put your question. Yes, good, uh, good afternoon. Um, you, you talk about after the crisis and what's to be done after the crisis. So my question is, is relatively obvious. You know, the inflation has been on a, on a downward trend from way before the crisis. 
and, and, and we all know the factors. And now there are more downward pushing factors with this destructive distraction that's going to take place. It's not a happy phenomenon of the economy readjusting itself for the right reason. And, 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 and so do you envisage that actually it will take much longer for governments to have to support the economy and therefore for the ECB to support governments in doing so, that the horizon is not 2022. Is there a scenario in your mind where actually you would understand that you need to do more and then what more could be done to pull up inflation towards your target? Yeah, uh, I, I think I would insist on that uh, differentiation with our target is to ensure price stability. Our target is not to make sure that governments are able to spend or governments can, can or, or, or to support a certain level of government, uh, government debt. But even if you look uh, and, and even if you, if you confine yourself to that perspective, I think there's reason to be expansionary and there's reason for monetary policy to be expansionary. And that's exactly what we are doing. I mean, the, the, the stance of monetary policy is, is historical when you look at, at, uh, at its uh, degree of expansion. Uh, we have reacted quite massively um, when the effects of the pandemic became uh, apparent with uh, a vast array of, of, of measures. I mean, from the PEP as the most visible part of this to uh, adjustments to the TLTOs um, and, and adjustments in, in the other instruments. And we will do so in the future if need there is with a view of our medium term objective of price, uh, price stability. But again, I think when you when you talk about the uh, coping with the crisis in the narrower sense, then fiscal policy is of course in a much better better place um, because then it's large part of the instruments that we need right now is related to transfers. Is make sure that uh, that there is this flow of, of of liquidity going on that you compensate, for instance those firms that had to close because of the pandemic because of government restrictions and those target instruments only fiscal policy has, has it at, at its disposal. Just before we go on to the next question, Jens, just following up from what Anya said, if you had to choose in a very binary way, let's say in December, between further reduction in negative interest rates and more QE, if somebody really put a gun to your head and asked you to choose, what would you decide? Well, first of all, I would not tell you, but uh, um, you know, <laughs> we, normally, us. We, we normally don't speculate about future uh, monetary policy decisions. And I think that's a very good uh, habit. But uh, what I can tell you, uh, David, because it's also has been printed in our uh, latest monthly bulletin, is that uh, we find that we haven't reached the reversal rate yet. This means that uh, interest rate decreases can still have uh, the, intended, uh, the intended effect for monetary policy. Of course, side effects might also increase. So all instruments are um, on the table. Uh, and the governing council also uh, underscored that uh, interest rate decreases are not excluded. So this is not my personal view, but this is the firm view of the governing council. And we decide when the situation comes up, weighing the cost and benefits of the different instruments, the side effects and the impact on inflation. Good. Well, thank you for that. Jack Caillou now from Rockost. Thank you very much, uh, President, for your very interesting remarks. Uh, it's very much in the spirit of uh, uh, David as well, in terms of the choice of the instruments and appropriateness of instruments. I understood that. You see in the short term, there's probably not much trade-off in terms of monetary and fiscal policy, given the need for response to uh, the COVID situation. In this context, when thinking about monetary policy and the appropriateness of the choice of instrument, the ECB has rolled out the, the PEP as a uh, financial market stabilization tool, which has been very effective. Uh, at the same time, the inflation outlook remains weak. And so I, I wanted to uh, have your personal opinion on the uh, relative contribution of the two instruments relative to asset purchases, the APP and the PEP, and how you consider them in the context of financial market stabilization and the inflation outlook. Thank you very much. Well, there are effectiveness is not, is not the issue with the PSPP and, and, and the PEP. Um, and uh, I'm quoting again, or I'm hinting again at one of our monthly bulletins, we 
undertook um, uh, empirical investigations in the uh, impact of those programs, and they are clearly positive with, with respect to our policy, policy aim. Um, but of course, they do have side effects, and at the end, you have to weigh the, the effect and the side effects. And the PEP uh, is, of course, a program that uh, is designed differently from the PSPP in the sense that it was specifically uh, tailored to this, uh, to the economic situation that we are currently confronted with. So uh, it, it, it is time, limit, time limited, it is temporary, it is uh, um, geared towards the pandemic, and that means that it also can enjoy a different degree of, of flexibility if, if you want, and also respond differently to the challenges that the current situation poses. I mean, we have uh, seen that in the early phases of, of the pandemic, market tensions have played a certain role, also uh, um, uh, differing across uh, countries or across the member states. So monetary policy transmission uh, was affected. So we needed a different, different instrument that could cope with those with those challenges. There, would you, yeah. just as a follow up before we go to the top Ziegler, would you recognize a quote from one of the members of the governing council who says there is nothing so permanent as a temporary easing measure from the European Central Bank? Um, I'm not sure who said it, but, uh, and of course, uh, my colleagues are always right. Um, but that's exactly the point that I was trying to make. The program is designed as temporary. If uh, it would become permanent, we would have to overall the design features because it's at the end of the day, the, 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 the whole picture of the limitations of the program, the flexibility of the program uh, that, that has to enter our judgment. And um, so in that sense, um, it's not it's, in a way you can just make a temporary program permanent without, with, without uh, uh, rethinking it. Thank you. Uh, Dove Ziegler from Element Capital. Uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, I'd like to ask a question that follows up on uh, the earlier questions by David and uh, Jacques. Uh, Mr. President, thank you for your time today. So just to discuss more the thinking behind and criteria for employing the flexible criteria of the PEP, which I think is what makes it a notable and powerful policy tool. Uh, could you just walk us through, though? I know you've written a great deal. You've spoken about this, and the ECP's you know, researchers have written about it. Can you walk us through the thought process and criteria for employing flexibility, and and the criteria under which you think it would no longer be appropriate to employ a flexible policy tool like the PEP. Well, again, the, the PEP has been designed to cope with the challenges of the crisis. And one of those challenges has been the market, the rising market tensions and the differences between countries and the difference in monetary policy transmission to the different countries. Normally what we do is we try to influence the risk-free uh, rate. Uh, and that is one rate for the, and so it's one monetary policy for the entire Euro area. Uh, it's not, a usual aspect of monetary policy that you differentiate between countries and try to, in a way, influence risk premium. That's, that's I would say, more of a, a, a crisis element or a crisis uh, uh, part of, 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 of the PEP. And that's why the PEP enjoys this flexibility, so that we can react in a crisis situation to uh, disturbances to our monetary policy transmission. But at the end of the program, it is bound to return to the capital key. Uh, and so this flexibility is not unlimited. It's bound to return to the capital key. And the program has to end when the crisis is over because it's bound also sort of temporary nature and it's bound, bound to the crisis. Good. Let's have a call now from Norman Lamont, a former British Chancellor of the Exchequer. You need to just unmute yourself, Norman. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much. Very elegant talk indeed. The Bundesbank was founded, obviously, for historical reasons, with very strict, clearly defined inflation targeting uh, mandate. Other central banks followed, the euro system followed uh, all over the world. Ind independence was granted and inflation targeting took uh, a grip. But since then, the role of central banks has increasingly expanded. 
the asset purchases have, I think, made the distinction between fiscal and monetary policy look increasingly blurred. The rhetoric of central bankers more and more resembles old-fashioned Keynesian demand management and doesn't seem actually as obsessed with inflation targeting as it once was. And there also seems to be a degree of coordination, as indeed there should be, between monetary authorities and uh, governments. But aren't central banks really now being asked to do too much and in danger of revealing their own limitations? Um, that sounded like a rhetorical question. Uh, um, and that was exactly the point I was trying to make in my speech. So I'm very happy that we tend to agree on this. Um, I think if we don't stick to a narrow interpretation of our mandate, then we risk to undermine our own independence and we risk that independence being questioned by, by others. And that relates to a lot of policy areas. Um, I mean, uh, take climate policy, for instance. For me, climate policy is, and fighting climate change is one of the main challenges that our civilization is confronted with these days. But we also have to see that it's not up to us central bankers to do our own, to, to devise our own uh, um, independent um, um, climate policy. Um, we have um, a narrow mandate and that means that of course we have to make sure that the financial risks from climate change are properly reflected in our risk assessment when we buy bonds for instance or uh, when we look at our collateral framework. We have to make sure that in banking supervision, uh, we uh, ensure that the banks take those risks properly into, into account. We have to devise stress tests for that purpose. But um, in my view, it would be uh, overstepping, let's say, that narrow mandate if uh, we thought that we had to influence prices to achieve that goal, because politicians do have much better instruments to achieve uh, that uh, very purpose. Uh, I mean, they have taxes, they have a cap and trade system and so on. So in a sense, we might end up correcting a political outcome that is there for a good reason without democratic legitimacy. And the result of this is that of course, our independence will be, will be challenged. No, I think it's good that you, you, you have indeed, I think, uh, got a certain amount of consensus there. Um, we've got a, a huge amount of other questions as well as the ones from the panel. And uh, hopefully we can just use up a little bit of time at the end, uh, maybe to go into um, a few minutes over our time. But uh, could I just put one question that's come in from the audience, which is related to the climate issue, please, Jens, before we then resume the, the panel. And that is whether the Euro system should incorporate climate risks into their own ratings and not just rely on rating agencies to do so. Yeah, I think the ultimate, I, I, would, I would share this goal. I think, and as I said, we have to better reflect the financial risks from climate change and also from, from the measures to fight it in our risk assessment. Uh, ideally, uh, in my view, that would work through enabling uh, the market to come up with a solution and the rating agencies to do it. So the first step in my view would be to basically act as a catalyst for transparency standards. So we need those transparency standards so that rating agencies, but also our staff in the central banks are capable of computing those risks. And then we have to, in a second step, incorporate them in, into, into our models and the rating agencies should incorporate them as well. The problem I think that you are confronted with in practice is that the time horizon of those risks is uh, sometimes different from the one that we are looking at uh, at central banks or even at commercial, commercial banks. I mean, it's a rather longer term risk. So there's a time horizon um, issue there. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, there's quite a few questions about climate change, but I won't go into them all now. Perhaps if we don't have time for all the questions from the wider audience, we could just send them to you and your office Jens, and you could perhaps answer them afterwards because there won't be time, I think, to go through, all, through them all now. Let, let's go back now to Michael Holstein, please, from the DZ Bank in Frankfurt. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, 
President Weidmann, my uh, question is on how the ECB uh, conducts its monetary policy and how uh, questions are discussed. Uh, for example, uh, Chief Economist Philip Lane a few days ago uh, raised the argument of a possible negative correlation between the euro area trade surplus and the inflation rate, meaning a higher trade uh, surplus uh, comes with a lower inflation rate. And uh, in my view, this raises a couple of issues. It implies uh, that there is some kind of good demand, internal demand, bad demand, external demand with regards to its inflationary effects. Um, and it puts the exchange rate in the focus of monetary policy. So my question would be, should monetary policy uh, in the future try to change the composition of effective demand to influence the inflation rate? Thank you. No, what we normally do, I, I, I think uh, Philip is certainly not basing his policy advice on just a single correlation. Uh, he's much more nuanced than, than this. And usually what we do is uh, we look at the forecast, like in December when we are going to meet, we will look at new forecast rounds. And there we have a full-fledged macro model where of course the exchange rate does play a certain uh, role, but among many other uh, factors. And my point is always in these debates, at the end, it's not the exchange rate. It depends also on the factors driving the exchange rate. Uh, and the repercussion on inflation rate and the meaning for uh, us in our monetary policy making uh, can 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 make a huge uh, can make a huge difference. So um, um, we are looking at a broad uh, the, the the response is that we are looking at a broad picture and we are not we are not trying to steer individual demand components. We are trying to to set one interest rate ideally. Now we are, we are a bit more, uh, let's say, widespread in setting interest rates also uh, for, for the longer uh, end of the maturity spectrum. Um, but we're setting this interest rate and then we have the economic agents react to that. Yes, I've been uh, told by your staff that uh, they're giving you another 10 minutes to perform in. Uh, okay. yet, yet, so uh, they're really getting your productivity they're rate very up generous today. With, with my time. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, so that's very kind of you. So before we go back to the uh, people in the panel, I just want to put in a couple of really interesting questions that have come in from the audience. It's about uh, digital currency, which is a mm -hmm. big thing these days. Um, um, one says, uh, would a digital currency give the Bundesbank more granular control to fulfill its mandate. I presume the question means the Bundesbank as part of the Euro system. Uh, and then the other one is that, do we have enough monetary policy instruments for a digital future? D do you consider CBDC should be a complementary to the extent it backs it up? Is it a complementary tool? And if so, what characteristics should this CBDC have in the interest of your monetary policy? Yeah, I mean, this is a very tough set of questions because we're in the midst of uh, debating CBDC in the governing council. You've certainly followed that we've published a consultation paper where we outline uh, the main themes uh, according to our view and uh, want you basically to react to that. My take on it is, is the following. Um, CBDC um, might be, uh, appears like a logical uh, step and it might also uh, have pos positive consequences on the efficiency of markets. So there are some, uh, um, let's say, quite positive aspects, but we have to see that, of course, this is a structural change that is quite fundamental. And uh, I am also at the same time concerned with the financial stability risks that come with it. I mean, digital bank run or a shift of deposits from commercial banks into that central bank digital currency that we have to fully understand and that we have to mitigate uh, in order that the balance of cost and benefit is, is positive. So a lot depends on the design uh, of uh, this uh, digital central bank uh, currency. And now we're talking about a limit to uh, holdings. We're talking about a tiering system like Ulrich Binzahl has suggested. 
So uh, there are design features that could limit those, those negative, uh, negative side effects. On the other hand, my main point is always that um, CBDC seems to be a very sexy topic these days. But a lot of the advantages uh, of CBDC could be achieved by improving the existing payment system. I mean, we can have programmable money that is not coming from the central banks. And we at the Bundesbank have several projects running that where we try to link, for instance, programmable money with our target two system. So that at the end of the day, only uh, there's a wholesale variant of uh, central bank digital currency, but the retail uh, um, variant is still provided by the, the, the commercial, commercial banks. Uh, we, have to, we have to make remittances or, or cross-border payments less costly, quicker and so on, but that can happen uh, within, the, within the existing system. And, and the TIPS, the instantaneous payment system that we've come up with in the Euro system is partly an answer to that. And at the end of the day, you'll see that then the only difference between those solutions and CBDC is credit risk. Uh, and uh, of course, we do emit the, the legal tender and commercial banks don't. Um, so that's, that's then the main, the main difference. Thank you. That's extremely uh, thoughtful and reflective. And the, the idea of a hybrid system, I think, is something that we all need to be looking at. Can I just go back to our list of panelists now and ask Mark Sobel, the OMFIF chairman at the United States, uh, the, our hearts are all beating faster, um, not just listening to you, Mark, but also wondering what's going on in Nevada. So, Mark, please put your question. You're going to have to wait a few more hours, David. Um, so one of the concerns about lower for longer rates is that it's going to fuel a, a search for yield, excess risk taking, and financial stability concerns. It said monetary policy should focus on its mandate, and then you should use macroprudential policies to deal with the financial stability risks. But macroprudential policies are still evolving. And um, I guess in Europe, you have the ESRB and you have national level policies. Do you feel that European and German macroprudential policies are sufficient for the task? And do you think that uh, macroprudential measures need to be strengthened to give, um, to protect monetary policies uh, scope and freedom? Yeah, I mean, first, I fully agree with you, uh, macroprudential policies, but more generally a sound banking system is a protection for uh, monetary policy. So it's like sound fiscal policy. That is one of the preconditions for us to be able to do our job. Uh, but at the same time, as you already uh, highlighted, a lot of the instruments are untested. There might be also some sort of decision inaction biases uh, that we don't really fully understand at this, at this point. So the, the argument I was trying to make in my speech was that the flexibility, the medium term orientation of monetary policy in the Euro system gives us at least some flexibility to incorporate the financial stability risks that monetary policy itself may, may create. So in that sense, that is very close to the BIS uh, view um, of, um, of course, trying to take a bit a longer term perspective to incorporate some of the financial stability risks also in monetary policy decision making. Are you happy with that, Mark? Or you can ask a follow-up because we're, we've got about six minutes left. So uh, Mark is never happy with the first answer. Do you want to follow up on that, Mark? Well, well, uh, Jens knows that I can be controversial from his path, from our past. But uh, how satisfied are you that you have the measures in place to deal with uh, financial stability risks? And in the ESRB and in the Bundesbank, and, and I accept your point that micro is a re very relevant complement to macro proof? Yeah. Um, well, I, I think, I mean, as I tried to hint at in my first response, um, sometimes the reaction times are a bit slow. So um, uh, I, I think we need to become quicker in acting also from a macro potential uh, perspective. Of course, there's this inherent tension between micro and macro potential supervisors uh, and, uh, and, and, and then there is a recognition uh, lag, there is a decision lag. So we tend to, we have to become somewhat quicker. 
So uh, we have um, a follow-up question in the absence of Catherine Nice, who I think has just dropped off the line. But, Jacques, I can allow you to put your follow-up question if it's very, very quick. Jacques Caillou. Thank you very much. Uh, it was uh, in relationship to the interest rate remarks that you made early on and the uh, current debate that is happening in other central banks across the world, there seems to have been a convergence of views among those central banks to use interest rates when the economy is in a recovery, we've heard that from uh, the Scandinavians and other central banks, is that uh, in, in, an, in when they are below uh, the zero lower bound? Uh, I'd be interested in your thoughts as to whether you share those views that uh, the uh, impact of monetary policy and the transmission of the monetary policy channel through interest rates was stronger away from lockdown situations and much more operational and effective during uh, a time of recovery after lockdown? Yeah, I mean, in the lockdown, uh, I think the transmission of monetary policy uh, is not, well, how, how, how should I phrase this? Because it's not, it's not a trivial uh, question, because I, I think part of our monetary policy transmission channels are impeded during lockdown. And that is very, very, easy to see. I mean, if, if people are confined, if they don't dare going out of their house to consume, then even low interest rates won't lure them uh, out and, and won't make, make the trip trick. So I think there are other transmission channels that work at this juncture. But once, of course, the, the lockdown is ended and or once people are also more confident to, to go out without the fear of, 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 of uh, contagion, uh, then the traditional, more traditional monetary policy transmission channels would, would kick in. Absolutely. Yeah. So we've got time for just uh, two more very quick questions before we then really finish the extra time, both from the audience, both very good ones, actually. Uh, one is that you mentioned side effects uh, in your speech. Of course, that was a phrase that came up in the Constitutional Court judgment in May. Um, one question that says interest rates are at all time low, uh, what will be the impact on savers, depositors, or pensioners as financial repression will decrease their income? Yeah, I think, I mean, that's, that's a question we also answered lengthily in one of our monthly um, bulletins, because this perspective of just looking at one hat that you might be wearing uh, is, of course, a bit uh, mis misleading. You are also a taxpayer. You might have financed a house. So um, if you really want to look at the distributional effects of monetary policy, you have to look at the full picture. And that is much less clear than, than, than the first look might insinuate. I mean, we saw, for instance, that uh, when you look at income distribution, uh, then the labor market effects of monetary policy play a very important uh, role, meaning that uh, it is actually um, reducing um, uh, inequality through that labor market effect. Of course, there are all those other effects that you've mentioned, but at the end of the day, you have to look at the sum of all these effects. No, thank you. We should counsel people to read the monthly bulletin. That should be one of the main messages. <laughs> that should today. be the main takeaway from today. Yeah. Final <laughs> question, and it's a delicious question from Paul Sheard at the Harvard Kennedy School. How different would the operation of the Eurosystem's monetary policy framework be if the euro area did evolve into a fully fledged fiscal union? Oh, I think we would have less uh, of a debate about uh, fiscal. I mean, my speech would have probably looked quite different because I do think that a closer integrated uh, union uh, and already the uh, crisis response by finance ministers, the next generation EU, helped also to relieve pressure from monetary policy to act. So uh, the sounder public finances, the better they're able to act, the better it is for monetary policy. And we can then focus on our primary objective much, much, much better. That's a futuristic question to, to end on. I know you did once say that you are very much in favor of fully fledged fiscal union and a European treasury, the European finance ministry and all those things. So <laughs> one day we may get there if everybody accepts what comes with it. I mean, sometimes I found this debate a bit um, biased in the sense that it's easy to ask for a fiscal union, but then you have to give up, of course, 
sovereignty over your public finances uh, to a considerable extent, then the 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 the, 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 the key uh, occupation. I mean, that's that's at the heart of what the parliament is doing, debating uh, debating the budget, uh, and this would be done then elsewhere. So asking for a fiscal union and not being willing to see its sovereignty is not, is not working. Um, and uh, as long as this goes hand in hand, then it, it could work. As long as we also, uh, or if we manage to install tough fiscal rules or, or at least fiscal rules that do work, uh, because you can also have this fiscal monetary policy interaction with a single sovereign and a single central bank. I think uh, there's no such thing as a free lunch and also what there's the Germans say, wasch mich, aber mach mich dich nass. That you have these two things sometimes do go together. We, we will end now. Uh, the film I thought of, uh, because you, you introduced it, Jens, is your fault for doing this. The film I thought of this is the one after the uh, Second World War starring Frank Sinatra from here to eternity. That makes me think about the uh, very long game that the central banks are involved in. Um, maybe also has something to do with the duration of government debt, all nicely funded by the central banks for the time being. One day, maybe that that party will stop. Um, I'd like to thank you very much indeed, both for your excellent remarks at the beginning, a very well-crafted speech with lots and lots of different food for thought, and the way that you've answered all the questions in an absolutely exemplary fashion. So thank you. I'm sorry we extended slightly at this part of the football game. It normally goes to penalties, but we won't do that. But thank you for going into extra time. We've all enjoyed it very much. We look forward to our next meeting, both virtual and physical. Thank you, David. It was a pleasure to see you and see all the panelists again. Bye-bye. All the best and look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you.